Um, we are in this series on the kingdom of God. So we've been talking about what is the kingdom of God and what is that all about? Um, this place, this reign of God in which um, God's name is hallowed and which God's will is done in which we experience um, the kingdom of God in, in, um, in all of its fullness as a, as a present reality. And now uh, we've been talking about, you know, what exactly does that look like? Because Jesus spends an awful lot of time um, throughout the Gospels talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and laying out in, in oftentimes in parables what that looks like. He oftentimes says the kingdom of heaven is like, and then tells a story. And so that's what we're spending some time in these uh, few weeks here looking at. Last week we saw that the kingdom of heaven is like what? I just read an article about that's talked about how um, your people, when they hear your sermons, they, they don't really remember what you say um, just a few days later. Uh, so, <laughs> I guess they were right. The, king, <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is like what? A, a wedding banquet, right? A wedding feast. You remember that now? Yeah, right? Okay. <laughs> it's this like this wedding feast to which... Everyone is invited, right? Remember, the hall is filled to overflowing with wedding guests and the fatted calf and the oxen. They've all, the, the meat's been slaughtered and barbecued and prepared. Um, and it's like South Carolina on 4th of July with barbecue and, you know, all the fixings and all the trimmings. It's this amazing, um, just generous banquet that is filled with all of God's love and grace, his overflowing abundance and irrational generosity. And everyone is invited to accept the invitation to come and experience that and participate in this kingdom and this feast. And today we're going to see that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is a secret. Talk about opposite extremes, right? The kingdom of heaven is a secret. Secrets are tricky business, aren't they? Benjamin Franklin said, three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. Secrets are tricky business, right? Um, kind of get all, it's a red flag when someone says, hey, can you keep a secret, right? <laughs> the answer to that is, no, I cannot. Please, don't tell me. Don't share any secrets with me. Um, secrets are tricky business. The kingdom of God, as we're going to see here, is like, it's like a secret. But not secret in something that's, you know, as in something that needs to be kept private um, not secret is something that needs to be you know locked away and hidden. It's more secret like secret like a like a mystery. The Greek word that is used when when Jesus says secret is actually it's mysterium, where we get the word mystery from. It's where that mystery word comes from. It's this. It's like the kingdom of God is like a secret. It's like a mystery in that it's something that not everyone grasps. Not everyone sees, not everyone accepts, not everyone believes in, even though it's like right there, hidden in plain sight for everyone to see and for everyone to experience, for everyone to accept and believe. But not everyone does. It's uh, a, the kingdom is like, it's a secret, kind of like, um, like the matrix is a secret. The matrix, which is this, you know, false reality that's right there for everyone to see and experience, but not everyone sees and understands what the matrix is or what real life actually is. It's a secret, a mystery, kind of like Wonderland or Narnia, which is literally, literally kingdoms, realms that are real and exist and are right there for anyone who believes, who wants to enter in, who, can, who wants to access them, but not everyone sees, not everyone believes, and not everyone experiences it. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is this secret. 
Um, and Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 13. Um, we're going to spend time in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to jump around a little bit. Um, I'm going to follow Ed's, Ed's Bible study um, kind of method. We're going to start in the middle, <laughs> and then we're going to go back to the beginning. Um, so Matthew chapter 13, we're going to start at verse 10, and then we're going to jump around a little bit. So Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 10. So the disciples came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, meaning the crowd, those who are kind of on the outside, to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For the people's heart has grown dull, with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, to hear what you hear and did not hear it kingdom of God is like, it's this secret, hidden in plain sight, this reality of the kingdom of God in our midst that Jesus makes possible. Remember, we've talked about this like each week now, where Jesus, where God is, the kingdom is. Jesus is God in the flesh, so where Jesus is, the kingdom is. And now we are Jesus's ambassadors representing God's kingdom on earth. So in a very real sense, where we are, the kingdom is. And yet, it's this secret, mysterious thing that not everyone sees, and not everyone accepts, and not everyone believes, and not everyone experiences the secret. Hidden right there in plain sight, available for everyone to experience. And to unpack this, Jesus shares this parable of the sower, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, so let's take some time to kind of go through it. And like we did last week, we've got our little chart. I was well prepared this week and actually put it up there first. Um, so we're going to look at the main, it's a little bit different from that last week. Last week, the parable had, you know, specific, you know, um, participants in the parable or in the story and each one of them kind of lined up with a specific person that Jesus in that day and age was kind of was specifically referencing or addressing and then it became the task of okay so who are we in the story this week it's a little bit different there's one kind of you know real person that we can make connections with and then there's these kind of depictions of people and their situations that are quite universal so it's a little bit different in that there's not necessarily very, you know, specific people like scribes and Pharisees that Jesus was talking about. It's more this, these kind of universal concepts, people who are like this or kind of find themselves in this situation. Um, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll match it up and see where we fall in in this parable of the sower. So now going back to 13 verse 1, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up 
since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now we'll skip down to verse 18. As Jesus now explains the parable to the disciples. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another sixty and in another thirty. Parable of the sower about this secret of the kingdom of God. That's good seed, isn't it? That's good seed. Did you catch that at the end? This seed is so good that it will yield, when sown in good soil, abundant harvests, a hundredfold, sixty, thirty. That is amazingly good seed. And I think that's an important thing to recognize as we explore and kind of pick apart this parable of the sower. There ain't nothing wrong with the seed. The seed is good. It yields abundantly, hundredfold, sixty, thirty. Amazingly good seed. The problem is the soil or the people. It gets a little confusing because it sounds like it sometimes Jesus is talking about soil and then it sounds like at other times he's talking about, you know, people as soil and then it sounds like he's talking about people as seed. It gets a little confusing. Don't worry about that. The point is, again, these kind of true-to-life situations in which people find themselves or true-to-life examples of people and what they are like, what their lives are like, what their hearts are like. We can't take it so literally that it becomes confusing. But central to this is the point that this is really good soil. A really good seed, sorry. <laughs> really good seed. Now I'm really making it confusing, aren't I? Really good seed. Really good seed. The problem is the soil. Who are you in the story? Who are you in the parable? The sower is obviously Jesus, um, his disciples. As Jesus, as his disciples, share the word, the good news of this kingdom of God. Who are you when it comes to where you fit in in this parable? We're oftentimes very much like the soil, or no, let's take that back. If you're in this room, <laughs> if you're gathered in this room, you're here in this sanctuary, you're here worshiping God, spending time in God's presence, you've tuned in online um, to watch this message, to participate um, in this um, gathering of the people of the kingdom of God, um, you're probably not the path. The path is people who, you know, when they hear this message about the kingdom of God, they just don't get it. They just don't get it. 
And as Jesus explains, because they just don't get it, um, it's like seed that has just kind of, that's been thrown on, on the path. Um, we were out for a walk this, earlier this week. We oftentimes you know, go down and walk around the, the neighborhood down here. We go down to the signal light and we go down. Anyway, that's not important. The point is that there is a part, there's a road there, I don't even know the name of it, that goes between this new neighborhood and Quick Trip. And when you walk along the sidewalk there, there's a cornfield right there. Corn's growing up. Um, looked like it was about knee high on 4th of July, so I guess that's going okay. Um, but there's a cornfield right there. And in between the field and the sidewalk, there's this kind of area where, you know, the ground's got a lot of weeds and stuff in it. And then there's a sidewalk. This is like seed that has been scattered, and this seed has fallen on the sidewalk on the path that has no chance of taking root and growing up and in that situation it's the enemy snatches away what has been sown because let's face reality here right there is this kingdom of god that is a present reality and if for anyone who's accepted this invitation into this relationship with god they are citizens of the kingdom of heaven if you're living in relationship with God, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If you're not living in that, you're not. And if you're not, you're outside of that. And there's no neutral ground in this. There's no neutral territory. There's no Switzerland um, in between, you know, this neutral country, this neutral nation or kingdom in between the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of what? The kingdom of this world that is ruled and led by the enemy of God. There's no neutral ground in between. So for many, they will hear the word about this kingdom of God, and for whatever reason, they're just not going to get it, or they're just not going to accept it. And in that case, it's like the word, the seed of that word is just snatched away by the enemy. Because that's living outside of God's kingdom, outside of the influence, outside of a relationship with God. So if you're here in this building right now, I would say probably not here. How about rocky ground? Rocky ground. Jesus talks about how, you know, this seed, some of it falls on this rocky ground. And it immediately takes root and sprouts up and starts to, starts to grow. But then the cares of the world, trials, tribulations, persecution happens. And these folks then fall away. And the seed withers and dies. Perhaps we find ourselves like rocky ground. Perhaps that even this is a, a pattern in your life. Perhaps this is a pattern in your life where, you know, you, you hear the word of God, you hear about the kingdom, you're in prayer, you're in the Bible, you're reading the word, you're worshiping, and, it's, you know, and your faith is just sprouting up and growing and flourishing. But then things happen. Life happens. There's challenges. Maybe there's doubts. Maybe somebody, you know, says something, criticizes you. How can you believe in that? You know, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Um, and the, the seed of doubt gets sown. And your faith just kind of starts to wither and, and dies a little bit. Sometimes I think we find ourselves in, that, in, a, in a cycle of that. Believing, accepting, you know going all in with Jesus, and, you know, we kind of sprout up and flourish for a little bit, and then things happen. It gets tough. Because the Christian life is not a life that's free of challenge. The Christian life, the life of discipleship, is a life of sacrifice. It's not an easy life. And what we claim to believe is... I mean, Paul talks about it in his letter. It's foolishness to the world. The world doesn't get it. So there's going to be persecution. The world is going to push back on our belief in God. 
the world is going to look at this life of discipleship as craziness and nonsense. The world is going to push back. We're going to experience trial and tribulation and persecution of some kind. It's just the way it is. For some of us, sprout up, faith take root, and those trials and tribulations come along and it begins to wither and fade. This may be us. How about the, the thorns? Rock the that area where the seed has been scattered, not on the path, it's not on the good soil, um, it's in this kind of it's in this rocky ground. Jesus talks about that as I just got this all wrong, didn't I? <laughs> um, we just hit that rocky ground, sprout up, fades away. Let's hit thorns. Thorns, the thorny ground. This may be us as well. Thorny ground. He talks about, you know, the word of God being sown in our hearts, and we um, believe it, we accept it, we live it. Um, the seed of faith begins to sprout up, and yet the cares of the world, and he specifically lifts up riches, gets in the way and chokes out the word. I can definitely relate to this. In my life, this is a challenge. I'm going to check. We can put Jeff here. This is a challenge in my life. Materialism is a temptation for me. I like stuff. I collect stuff. Um, those of you who've been in the basement of the parsonage, you know Jeff collects stuff. Jeff collects records. Jeff collects books. Like That's a thing. And I have to be careful in my own life, very, very careful, that the love of that stuff does not outweigh my love of God. I think God blesses us um, with his provision. God blesses us with um, things. And I honestly believe that God um, loves to see us enjoy life and that God wants to see us enjoy what he has blessed us with. And yet there's this constant pull and temptation um, to elevate these things, whether it's wealth, riches, money itself, or whether it's the things that we can buy with it. There's this constant temptation to elevate those things to the, the level of God or even higher than God in our lives and in our hearts. It's a constant pull for many of us and definitely for me. I have to be on guard against that because that is very, can become very much like thorns choking out the word of God, the, the, the kingdom of God in our hearts and in our lives. When we turn other things into gods, the word of the kingdom is being choked out in our lives. So maybe that is a reality for you, the cares of this world, and maybe it's wealth and riches and material things specifically that is a concern for you. What about good soil? Many of us find ourselves like we are, like our, the soil of our hearts is that, that good soil in which the word has been sown and it has taken root and it has sprouted up and it has grown and we are producing fruit. What would that fruit be, do you think? Fruits of the Spirit, uh, my mind immediately goes to that. Fruits of the Spirit. Um, lives that look like, you know, Christ-like faith, love, hope, and power. And maybe even more specifically, fruit. Lives that are, as dis lives of discipleship that are producing other disciples. Literally, other disciples bearing fruit. Living lives that produce other followers of Jesus. That, that is good fruit. And some of us are living lives that are bearing that out, that is producing that fruit. Some hundredfold, some 60, some 30. But in order for that to happen, it seems to me, we have to be the sower. If our lives are going to produce fruit, 
if our lives of discipleship are going to produce um, other disciples, other followers of Jesus, then we have to embrace the role of the sower. Here we are. This is our calling. Our calling is to be ambassadors of Christ, representing the kingdom of God, sharing the secret, if you will, of this kingdom of God with others, sowing that seed in the hearts of everyone that we come into contact with, sowing the seed of the kingdom of God in the hearts of everyone we come into contact with. Remember last week, the king gets frustrated because the original people who were invited to the banquet didn't come. And so he sends out the, the servants, the slaves, and says, you know, go invite who? Everyone else. Invite everyone else. The example here is to sow the seed of God's word, the seed of the kingdom of God, amongst everyone who we meet. Because we don't know what the soil of someone else's heart is. We don't know if their heart is like the path, and they're just not going to accept this word about the kingdom of God. We don't know if they've got, you know, you know their heart is like rocky ground. We don't know if they're going to be one who falls away after a little bit of persecution or trial and tribulation. We don't know if a person's heart is full of thorns, whether they're caught up in the cares of the world. We don't know if their heart is good soil. And if we have a, an inkling or a clue that their heart might be good soil, we don't know what that's going to produce. 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold. We don't know. And neither are we responsible for tending, what, tending the garden, if you will, of their hearts. Our job is to sow the seed. The sower, from one point of view, you could say the sower is a terrible farmer. Right? From one point of view, the sower is really an extremely ineffective farmer. He's just scattering seed everywhere. He's not concentrating on the good soil and making sure that most of the seed gets planted in the good soil. He's literally scattering seed or she is literally scattering seed everywhere. And some of it falls on the path, and some of it falls on rocky ground, and some of it on thorns, and some of it on good soil. The word of the kingdom of God is for everyone. So we're just called and sent to share it with everyone. With everyone. Through word and deed, it seems to me. We share the word of the kingdom of God uh, through word and deed. Some of us are very comfortable. You know, evangelism is kind of our spiritual gift. And so some of you are extremely comfortable just going up to whoever, anybody, friends, relatives, acquaintances, total strangers, and saying, you know, hey, if you died today, where would you end up, heaven or hell? Some of you are very comfortable having that kind of conversation, that very kind of in your face, like shining, you know, a flashlight right in someone's eyes and saying, hey, you got to get right with God. Some of you, that's your gift. Others of us are over here, and our gift is, you know, not necessarily having that type of conversation with someone, but our gifting is, you know, we're gifted in things like service and mercy. Um, um, we're, we're very good and very well equipped to, to, to serve other people. Um, maybe generosity is a spiritual gift that you have. And so we're very good at, you know, this kind of, what, concept of friendship evangelism. I'll, just, I'll, live, a, I'll live this Christian life. Um, I will shine the light of God. You know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And my friends and my neighbors and my family, you know, they will see this faith that I'm living out. And then... They'll come to me and, and ask the question, why is it that you live so differently than everyone else? Seems to me we have to kind of blend those two. Word and deed. Because it seems to me if, we, if we're over here living lives of faithful discipleship in the hopes that others will, 
you know, be intrigued. Um, and yet God's name is never hallowed in the midst of all of that. And how are, how are they going to, you know, get it and grasp this um, word of the kingdom? How is that seed of the kingdom really going to get into their hearts and take root? It's word and deed. For example, um, we like to, when we go out to eat, we like to tip big and to be generous. Um, it's really this kind of concept of, you know, God has blessed us. Um, he's blessed us with what we have. And, you know, it's a little bit of, we want to share that with others, and we want to be irrationally generous with, with others, like God is irrationally generous with us. And we want to share that blessings with others. So we went out to eat, I think it was last week, a restaurant here in town, which now has this super cool thing on the bill. You don't even have to tally up the tip. They literally have choices. You can give, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, or you can write in, like, you know, something else. So... I did the 30%, do the 30% tip. And the server, you know, came and, you know, kind of said goodbyes and took the, the check and everything and disappeared and then came back. It was just, thank you guys so much. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I missed the moment. I did the deed, right? I mean, I shared irrational generosity. My heart was in the right place. God has blessed us. We want to bless others. We're gonna, I'm going to bless this server with a 30% tip. And then when she came back and said, thank you for that, did I say, hey, you know what? God has just blessed us, and we want to share that blessing with you. No, I didn't say it. I don't remember what I said. Oh, you're welcome, or, you know, our pleasure. I don't remember what I said. But I missed the moment to connect deed and word about the kingdom of God. And I got to thinking about this. You know, I think also with this, like some people are going to be like the path and some are going to be like rocky ground and some are going to be like the thorns and some are going to be good soil and we don't need to worry about which one. So the pressure is kind of taken off a little bit. And also, not every, you know, 30-second conversation with, like, the server at a restaurant is going to, you know, run the whole, what, the whole chronology from initial conversation about God to this person giving their life to Jesus and getting saved in that moment. Like, it's not always going to go that way. In fact, most of the time, it's probably not. So pressure is off. Just sow the seed... Just sow the seed through word and deed, and trusting that, some, that the seed is going to work its way in there. Or, think about this, trust that another sower is going to come along, and they're going to do the same thing. Think about this. What if every one of us hillside people, when we go out to eat, we tip big, the 30% or more? And then in those moments when those servers come back and say, wow, man, did that, thank you so much. And then, you know, Jeff starts it off by saying, you know, God's blessed us. We want to bless you. Uh, it's, just part of, you know, who we, it's just part of who we are as followers of Jesus. And in that moment, that server's like, okay, well, that's a little weird and strange. Okay, whatever. Thanks for the big tip, you know. And then a couple days later, Don and Elaine are at the same restaurant, and they tip 30%. And they, wow, thank you so much for the, you know, for, for, thank you so much for that. Yep. God's blessed us. We just want to bless you and share that blessing with you. And then, you know, a couple days later, I know Adam's there with his kids, and they tip 30%. And the same server is like, oh, my, you know, thank you so much. And, yep. God's blessed us. We just want to bless you. I mean, it won't take long before that person is like, oh, you're one of those blessing people. <laughs> right? I mean, that's just sowing the seed over and over and over again until it comes to the point where this person's going to be like, I, what, what is this blessing thing? What is this all about? Now the, I mean, you know, now the door is wide open to this conversation about the kingdom of God and what it means to experience this new, full, and eternal life that Jesus has made possible. You sow the word everywhere that we go with everyone who we meet 
not worrying about what type of soil the seed's going into, but just scattering the seed through word and deed. Just sowing the seed. So what are you going to do this week? We've got next steps to take. We've been given good seed. We're not responsible for the condition of the soil in other people's hearts. We're not responsible for that, and we don't have control over it. We do have control over the condition of the soil in our own hearts. We do have control over that. So maybe this week we need to take some time to analyze the soil of our own hearts. What does the soil of your heart look like? Probably not the path. You got rocks in your soil of your heart? Are there challenges and tribulations that are going on in your life that's, you know, kind of sucking the life out of your own faith? You need to get in there with a hoe and pull some Pull some rocks out of that soil. Maybe you need to forgive someone or accept forgiveness. Maybe you need to confess something. You got thorns that are choking out the seed of God's word in your heart? Are there some you know, cares of this world? Is, um, is, is uh, finances or money the lure of wealth? Is that a thing for you? Is it materialism choking out the seed of God's word in your heart, or is your heart good soil? This week, maybe it's a week of uh, fertilizing the soil of our hearts. Because this, I can guarantee, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do this unless the soil of our hearts is this good soil. We just won't get there. It's the, it's the depth and the intimacy of our relationship with God that enables and empowers us to sow the seed of God's word in other people's hearts and lives. So maybe we just need to fertilize the soil of our own hearts. Fertilize the soil of our own hearts through time with God in prayer and in his word. And then, let's share the secret. Let's share the secret. Our faith is personal. It is not private and not intended to be. Let's share the secret and sow the word, the seed of the kingdom of God in the hearts and lives of other people through word and deed. Let's be those blessing people that sows the seed, scatters it everywhere, shares it with everyone, everyone who we encounter, no matter what. Um, Let's stand together. Almighty God, um, we give you thanks again and praise for your son Jesus, for his life, for his willingness to pour himself out, to sacrifice himself. We rejoice and celebrate in your kingdom, your kingdom of heaven, that you are moving to earth. May we, as your disciples, live in a way that brings heaven to earth, that establishes your kingdom here on earth, in our homes, um, in our communities, in, in in our nation, in our lives, that your kingdom may come, that your kingdom may be revealed. Your kingdom may come alive here on earth as it is in heaven. Um, As we go forth into the world, send us out as your sowers to share the word of your kingdom, to scatter that seed far and wide amongst everyone who we meet. Power us, enable us, Holy Spirit. We say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, we go into the world um, sent to live like Jesus, to reveal the living God. Uh, Have a fantastic week, a fantastic and safe 4th of July, and we'll see you next weekend.